Welcome back to another episode of In Systems We Trust. My name is Marquis. I'm your host. And today I'm speaking with Chris Ronzio. Chris is the founder and CEO of Trainual, a leading software platform transforming the way businesses onboard, train, and scale teams. Chris is on a mission to help businesses, business leaders document and delegate so they have more time to focus on the things they love. Serving businesses in over 180 countries, Trainual has been recognized on Inc.'s 2001, 2022, and 2023 best workplaces list and landed in the top 5% of the 2022 Inc. 5000 list. Wow. Chris is also the author of the best selling book, The Business Playbook How to Document and Delegate What You Do So Your Company Can Grow Beyond You. Love that title. And then outside of work, uh, Chris lives in Scottsdale, Arizona with his wife and two boys. He's a huge Phoenix Suns basketball fan and competes in marathons and triathlons, including a recent marathon in Antarctica. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks, Marquis. Great to see you again. You as well. You as well. I, I have to hear about Antarctica. Um, like I follow you on social. Like I think people that know who you are, they, they follow you and they see that you're, you're an athlete. And uh, I think you get it with your brother sometimes. But what was the experience like doing a, a marathon in Antarctica? It was crazy. It, you know, it's one of those things you don't expect to see with your eyes. You know, you see it on like planet Earth or national, nas- uh, natural ge- national geographic. And it, it's like when you see floating icebergs in the ocean and you see, you know, seals and sea lions or you see penguins just walking around like pigeons in New York City. It's just like <laughs> a pretty crazy experience. But I think the best part about that is five, six years ago. I couldn't run a mile like I, I've not always been into this stuff, but really soon after I got into racing and pushing myself, my brother and I signed up for this Antarctica marathon as like a, a destination, you know, years in the future. We couldn't afford it. We could afford the deposit, but we couldn't afford the trip. And I absolutely couldn't run that kind of distance. But having that goal out in the distance uh, is is uh, is always something to shoot for. So that's that's uh, I always love having something in the, in the distance. That's incredible. Was the goal to get to Antarctica? Did you have like a time you were trying to place under? I mean, that's an accomplishment in itself, just being on the continent. Yeah, yeah, no, the the goal was not uh, time. And with most of the races that I run, it's not about the time. It's more about finishing. It's more about being in the in the right shape that you could do this thing. Uh, so mm. I'm, I'm not trying to be on the podium or anything like that. I got a business to run, you know, yeah. but 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 I, I love being in the event. Awesome. You heard it here, folks. You can do anything you put your mind to. Thanks for sharing that. So let's yeah. uh, start where we typically do on this podcast, just talking about your background a little bit. Um, I know anyone who knows the story of Trainual and how, you know, Trainual got its start. You know, we hear about, you know, your, your, you had started in consulting, right? You had a consulting business working with small businesses, but I want to like talk about the way back. I think there's a story about a 14 year old boy, you know, starting a video production company Take us back there, Chris. I'd love to know the the details of how you started and you know developed this this mind and this passion around process and structure that led you to the point you're at today. Yeah, so when I was 14, I had always been a kid entrepreneur. I always had the little neighborhood businesses. I loved printing business cards on my computer. I loved figuring out how to make money on the weekends. I loved buying my own clothes and CDs and stuff like that. And so I was always entrepreneurial, always selling my neighbors something. But when I got to high school, I thought I wanted to be in video production, film production. I thought I want to be uh, like a sports center broadcaster. That was my original idea. So I signed up for our film class, our film uh, thing at our, our school, the club. And what happened is like the school had just gotten all this brand new equipment and no one was certified to use it. So my friend and I took the test. We went through the training and we had the run of the mill of all this new digital gear. And so because of that, we produced this show and our town's cable access station had nothing else to air except for our little kid show. It was like a it was almost like a late night show where, you know, we'd interview people and we'd talk about what's going on around the town. And so all you could watch on our cable access station 
was like the bulletin board of what's happening like in the town gazebo and then our half hour show you know <laughs> and so and so our show would air like dozens and dozens of times per week and it got to be uh you know where people would recognize us in the grocery stores and be like oh you're the you're the kids from tv and so people started asking like could you film my cousin's wedding or could you film my son's bar mitzvah or my this my grandpa's birthday or something like that and we realized we could make money with video and so that's where it all started 14 years old making money doing video stuff and that evolved pretty quickly as we started doing events at the school. We did talent shows, we did soccer games, we did a big cheerleading championship that they hosted at the school. And I saw that we could make a lot more money if we filmed an event and sold it a hundred times to the participants in the stands rather than doing one production for one customer. And so that's really where the business started to take off. And through high school, through college, I grew this business to where we were not only just doing, you know, events and productions in my state, but all over New England where I grew up, then up and down mm -hmm. the East Coast. And then I start bidding on these big national jobs. And pretty soon we're doing events all across the US, all 50 states. We had over 300 camera operators. We had three, three different offices. And in building that business, I realized that the most important part of scaling a business is your operations is that you can consistently mm -hmm. operate and consistently deliver the same product to your customers. It was almost like a franchise model. You know, if you go into any Starbucks, you get the same experience. And I wanted that for my customers. And so little by little, we built these systems, we built these processes, we built the structure where our brand was the same, no matter where you went. Our process for delivering the footage was the same, no matter where you went. Our sales mm -hmm. process when you came to the table was the same, no matter where you went. And it was that that was ingrained in me over years and years and years that would eventually lead to first my consulting and then to Tranual. Incredible. So you're a teenager at this point. You've got three offices going. So obviously your need for documentation and creating these standards in the franchise model you were creating was because you were still in school, I'm assuming, right? And you, you, needed, uh, you needed help. You needed to bring on other people. Was that the case? Yeah. So when I first went to college and, and I had to be in class, I, I realized I can't do all these productions, these jobs that are popping up. And so the first thing I did my first semester of school was I took the train into the city, into Boston, where I was, and I started messaging people uh, in the film schools around Boston. And I asked them to meet me for coffee and I would sit down with them and I'd figure out, are they an editor? Are they a, a production manager? Are they, you know, really good with lighting? Uh, do they have their own camera? And I made this paper directory at the time of people I took, I would pull out my digital camera. I'd take a photo of them across from me at the coffee shop and I'd write down all the different things that they could do so that when I had a job come up, I'd flip through my papers and I'd figure out like who is best suited to do, to do this job. And, uh, and that worked for a while, but that was the very beginning of like roles and responsibilities. That's why I'm so glad that you're here today. Like, I don't know if that's anywhere else. And like, I had no idea about like that very specific detail. So incredible. Okay. Yeah. So lots of learning. Um, I understand you had an exit from that video production company that led you into your consulting, which is Organized Chaos. So, so kind of tell us about that and how you transitioned then from video production, late night TV star to, you know, this <laughs> consultancy owner, you know, doing systems and operations for companies. Yeah. So the, the video production business, you know, I had that for 12 years. It was so much fun. I learned a ton. It was it just a joy to build. I love the people that I worked with. But as it got towards, you know, year 10, 11, 12, I was getting a little burnt out. We we're doing a lot of volume, like a lot of productions. I was traveling a lot. Uh, and even if we would hire production managers that could run the events, um, you know, my my only real passion was like, how do, how do I either get us bigger productions, bigger contracts, or be innovative with our tech and figure out new ways to do things. And so for a while, it was like this innovation playground. And, and then that stopped being exciting to me. 
And so what happened was I had a director of operations that was ambitious and he wanted to take on a bigger role to run the company. And so I thought, why don't I treat this business like an owner instead of being the, the CEO, instead of being the president, what if I just step back to being the owner? So I put uh, our, our director of operations in charge. He became the president of the company. I took myself off payroll. Uh, so no, no job, no employment. And, and for about six months, I trained him on every last thing that he needed to know. And so to kind of fill my time to find something else for me to do, I started telling my other entrepreneur friends, Hey, uh, if you want, um, I could work at your office one day a week and work on your systems and learn your industry. And, and, you know, I was just throwing it out there. It was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So let me just do this. So over that next year, I, without really knowing it, built up a really great consulting business and realized my video company could run by itself. So I sold the video company to a competitor and went all in on consulting, started hiring employees for the consulting business and, uh, and started scaling the consulting projects. And what I learned there is that process and operations is industry agnostic. It didn't matter that I grew up in video productions. It mattered that I knew how to replicate a service. I knew how to automate things with technology. I knew how to create a division of labor to make things more scalable. And I could apply that to every different business that I worked with. And so for the next few years, I started just making operations manuals, making training videos, uh, process mapping out different businesses and improving how they did what they did. And what I saw is that over and over and over again, I would be delivering people a Dropbox folder of their SOPs or a few YouTube videos. And that was how I was doing my engagements. And I thought, man, if I really want to grow this consulting business, I need some proprietary IP. I need something that's mine. And, and so that's where the idea for Trainual came from. So I, I sketched out Trainual as a you know, free mock-up tool that I downloaded online. So I designed the original version. I found some contract developers that built this thing for me. And, uh, and I really just built it as a solution for my consulting clients. That's how it all started, but, but it worked. And, uh, and that's, that's when we wanted to scale it. The rest is history. I love that. And the fact that at that point you knew that the Dropbox Google drive version wasn't scalable, um, and to take that information and knowledge and to create something that potentially was, because I still see that all the time when I meet with customers, when we're looking and we're doing discovery for our clients and going through, we're like, all right, let's do some, let's understand how you work. Like we're doing some mapping or we're looking at their processes and it's like, okay, show us. And what typically happens, and it's funny, every time it does is the owner or the business leader will take us into their Google drive open up a folder and pull up a, a rogue uh, Word doc or Excel spreadsheet and say, yep, yeah, this is how we do everything. Um, this is what it looks like. These are the steps. And one of their team members or subordinates comes on and is like, we we don't use that. Like, we, I've never seen that before, right? And like, I've been here for two years. So it's not just about the documentation. It's about the communication and organizing the information in a way that is accessible and then training your team on where it exists and then how to contribute and, and grow yeah, it. Trainual's got two halves to it. It's the training and it's the manual, right? Like you've got the information, the documentation about your business. That's the manual. That's all the all the, the the stuff, all the knowledge in the company. But then if you don't invest in the training, if you don't create an experience of educating your new people and keeping your existing people up to speed, then the information doesn't stick. You know, documents aren't training. And as I was giving people Google Docs or Dropbox folders and Word Docs, it was like, great, we've got all this stuff and it sits on the shelf. How do I even know people read it? How do I know they've seen the latest version? It wasn't training. It was just documentation. And so that was the problem we were trying to solve was really accountability. How do I, as an employer, create the expectation with my employee that says, here is the job I expect of you. Here is the current best practice for the company on how it's done. Because if you're not communicating the current best practice, then how do you expect them to perform at their highest level? You know, how do you expect them to succeed? And a lot of people just throw people to the wolves. They just say, hey, like yeah. jump in, try to do this. And when they fail, it's like, well, I must have been the wrong person. It's easier if I just do it myself. No, it's, it's more likely that it's bad training than it's a bad person. And so you've got to put some of that onus on yourself to say, did I set the proper expectations? 
Exactly. And, and further to that point, I mean, they, they come on and during their onboarding, if we have documentation or if we have uh, what we feel to be robust onboarding program, we tell them the information once, we might show them where it is. And we think because we told them once, right, that that should be enough, right? That they were hired as the expert, the SME, and, and, and that's enough, right? Like I did my job as a leader, go do it. But to your point, yeah, like if, if there is a missing link or if there's something that they don't understand, there's a, a breakdown in the process, it's likely that the, that the leader, you know, the person that's setting the, the expectations on process didn't spend the time to train properly, didn't communicate early enough or often enough where that information yeah. then, you know, stuck with that, that new hire. So definitely a huge issue. Yeah. And totally. so I'd love to understand some more of those challenges, like your experience going from the original consulting business to train you all. And, um, obviously your role looks a little bit different now, but what would you say are some of the, the common issues that you still see small businesses facing when it comes to organization or their, their lack of, and then delegation? Yeah, I think delegation is the biggest problem for people because you you can be disorganized and still be wildly successful. But if you can't figure out how to delegate, if you can't empower other people beneath you to do the work that you used to do, then you're always going to have a hand in that work. And if you're trying to micromanage everything in the business, then you can't possibly scale beyond what you can see. You know, and and so a lot of entrepreneurs, they get into business themselves, they get uh, excited by the control that they have, by the autonomy that they have. And when you bring in other people, instead of feeling like you're empowering them and giving them autonomy, you feel like you're compromising your own leadership and autonomy by handing things away. You know, you're giving yeah. things away to other people and you can't control how it's done. And if they're not doing it exactly like you want it done, you start to feel insecure and you start to want to jump back in and, and be all over that person. And so a really big hurdle for people to get through is how to delegate, is being comfortable with delegation and focusing on not the way that someone gets there exactly, but the end result. Somebody else could achieve the same end result and have a different path to get there. And maybe their path was more efficient, more effective, more innovative. And now they create this new best practice for the business. But if you don't wow. give anybody that, that wiggle room to be able to innovate, then your company will never outgrow you. So it's, it really is about enabling people. So one example I, I've been giving recently is, you know, chat GPT came out a year ago. Everybody talks about that as like this, it's this superhuman thing that you can ask, you know, this, this LLM, anything, and, uh, and it can get you a big way uh, toward whatever the task you're trying to do is right. But how many people are using that every day? Not many, a lot of people are talking about it. How many people are using it all the time? You know, because people natively are not good at delegation. We don't yeah. think about it. We don't start doing a task and say, how do I get someone else or something else to help me with this? We just put our head down and we do the task. And so in the same way that you've got, you know, everyone's talking about this thing, couldn't have made a bigger splash in the world. Everyone knows what it is. How many people are using it every day? Well, that tells Agreed. you that most people aren't good at delegation. <laughs> so right. if you can get over that hurdle, then you know, you, you're not just going to be more productive, but that's actually how you scale your business to the next level. I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I saw that popped up on your LinkedIn this morning. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna bring up Top something of mind about for me, yeah. Absolutely it is. Yeah, and I absolutely agree with you. But I want to back up to something that you said. I mean, it's really interesting and it sounds like in your model, um, whether it's at Trainual or just in your approach to best practices, it's like you're welcoming innovation. Where someone like me as the owner, or if we take any small business owner and, you know, we want to get all of that institutional knowledge out of their head, we get them to document absolutely everything. And then this is the playbook. Now, this is how we do things. Right. And there are ways in which, yes, process improvement needs to happen over the months and years. And we involve our teams for that. But in your opinion, what is that like good balance between, no, this is tried, tested and true. And, you know, someone who says, no, actually, we should be doing it this way, because I, I think there's 
there's definitely a fine line. And I'd love to understand just your thought there of what is too much room to give people for innovation versus what needs to be our standards. Well, you want to maintain a standard of a certain quality or a certain experience. And so I think this is a, a risk aversion kind of conversation, you know, so, so very macro in any business, I think, you know, like 60 to 80% of stuff should be pretty dialed in. And maybe that other 20 to 40% is where you're innovating and you're testing new things. Businesses are changing all the time. It's just are the the big picture things changing in your business or are the little process things behind the scenes changing in your business? So the way I would encourage people to think about this is like, you, you don't want to rock the boat dramatically for your customers. And so like if your customers are used to buying a hamburger and all of a sudden you start giving out green hamburgers, like that might be a problem for your customer. You know, like yeah. that is a massive difference in the end product for your customer. But if behind the scenes in the kitchen, you're like, well, we used to assemble the burgers like this and we cook the bacon last and we're always waiting for the bacon to finish. Well, maybe let's start cooking the bacon first so that it's done as soon as I'm ready to assemble it. Now you've like cut down, you know, millisecond off your burger assembly process. <laughs> like that's not going to affect your customer that's shaving time off of your process. And those things businesses should be innovating on constantly. And so what I always encourage people to think about is like your best practice is only your current best practice. How you do things today is the best way you've figured out how to do things. That is like the high water mark for how we do this type of process. But anybody within the company should have the ability to suggest a better way to do it, to innovate. And that should be celebrated across your company. That's how you build this culture of innovation is by saying, you know, any type of like lean improvement, anything that anyone wants to suggest, we're willing to try, we're willing to test. And if it works better than the old way, now we've got a, you know, save as new. Now we've got a new version of this yeah. process of how we do things and we roll it out to everyone. And that's the way that innovation works. It's just a matter of, is your company set up to enable that consistently? Or is change management, is innovation in your company really hard? Is it a laborious, boring, long process that takes forever to change something? Or can you do that dozens of times a week and make sure that you're rolling it out to people, that they're always with the new current best practice. Uh, and, and that's how you, you get an edge on your competitors is you're always doing things better. So good. Um, I wrote down something you said earlier, like your, your best is only your best right now, right? Like your best practice is only your best practice right now. I think that that's so true. And uh, that definitely answers my question on how we innovate and how we open up space to, um, to, to innovate. One question that I always get asked, um, I, I did a talk yesterday and it's funny you bring up the thing about the hamburger. I have a similar demonstration where I talk about like how to make toast. Right. And it's really simple. Everyone knows how to do it. And then I get people to stand up and we talk about different ways that we make toast and we, we see what the differences are. And I'm like, there's no wrong way to make toast, right? There are just different ways that we do it. The problem exists when we're all in the same kitchen making toast for our customers and we're all doing it differently. So there are those misalignments. And if you don't standardize some of those things, right. But then if you're not asking the questions on, how you made yours or, you know, what you do to get it so nice and golden brown, um, then that's when you run into issues. Yeah. So, and some people would say, oh, how, how do I make a toast? I stand up and clink my glass and address the room. You know, like if you don't, if you don't like, if wow. you don't give the, the description of like exactly what you want, the end result of what you're trying to do, people can can perceive that in so many different ways because how people hear you is through the lens of their whole experience. It's who they are. It's, it's not. And so you as a company have to have your company way of this is what we mean as a company, not this is how all of our people interpret this. Chris, do I have your permission to take that line and insert into my speaker notes? <laughs> <laughs> That's the part Go about the it. clicking of the glass. That's genius. Um, Go for it. It's so true. So anyways, um, the question I was going to ask you was, and the one that I get asked often is when it comes to documentation and standardizing our processes, where do we start? We're, we're dealing with a lot of busy 
business owners, um, business leaders, they're managing teams, they've got budgets, they've got their day to day, and they feel like they need to stop everything. They feel like they need to just put a pause on current operations and create that space so that they can document things. But that's not realistic in a lot of cases. How would you respond to, where do I start? Well, think about a documentary of a famous artist or something. Like I saw uh, Ed Sheeran or Taylor Swift like, or, or J-Lo, like these documentaries popping up on Netflix. You know, where, where do they start documenting? It's like whenever they decided to make the film, they started documenting. Like they, they, there was a day where someone just started following them around. And that's when the story begins right? Like you'd have to just start. It's not about capturing everything. It's not about stopping your whole life and saying, we're going to do this thing because your business just can't stop. It's about deciding mm -hmm. that as of today, we're going to start recording things as we go. And when we look back a year from now, two years from now, we've got this body of work that is impressive and it's useful for the whole business. And so the first tip would be just start. My second tip would be start where you have the biggest fire, you know? So for some people, they have very different needs, like why they would start documenting, why they would start, um, you know, capturing knowledge for their business. So for some, it may be, we want to open a second location by the end of the year. For other people, it might be, I am launching a, a sales person. I've never had sales and I'm going to try this for the first time. And now there's this like desperate need for me to get the, the tasks out of my head that I've done in that role because I want to hire a salesperson by next month. And so you've got to start with wherever your motivation is. Like, what is the why? Why are you doing this? Because that dictates where you need to start. You're not going to document your entire business at once. That's impractical. You're going to document an entire role because you've got that position starting in your company, or you're going to document a particular task because you've decided to bring on a, a virtual assistant and you want to offload that off of your plate. Uh, or you're going to document a, the story about your business because you've got a, a few employees starting and you're sick of telling the story every day and you want uh, the story to be recorded in a video. And so everyone's going to have like a different motivation. So I say, start with wherever the fire is, wherever the urgency is. And then my last answer would be, there are things that change less frequently in your business. There are things like your core values, your mission, your vision, the founding story of why you created this business, the profile of your ideal customer, the industry that you serve, the competitors that you're up against and how you position yourselves against them. Those things are more concrete than a lot of the process things in your business. And so I always point people towards that category of knowledge, that the profile of your company and say, if you work on one thing, if you want to invest time in one thing that's a little more timeless, spend time on that because that foundational knowledge is important to every single person across the company and not just one narrow role or one person or one location. So true. And just a quick story. Um, I used to run a marketing agency and what you said earlier about, you know, you're, you're tired of telling the same story over and over again. That was it for me. I became frustrated that my team kept coming to me for answers. Right. And, and at one point I, I liked that I was the person that had all the answers. I liked being that resource, but as you know, business grew, I couldn't be that person anymore. And so I got frustrated one day and I threw on loom.com and I just said, here yeah, you yeah. go. Here's all the things you need to do. This is where you can find them. Don't ask me anymore. So it did come out of a place of, of frustration and where I you know, needed to go next was, okay, we have these videos, great, but it, now it's like, how do we structure them? And it was actually, um, I don't remember where I found it originally, but Trainual had put out a PDF for some kind of lead magnet, and it was this SOP, like getting started template. So everything you said around general company information, your policies, your competitors, everything was like the perfect foundation for like how I got started documenting SOPs from a marketing agency. So 
thank you for that. Yeah, no, I'm glad you found that. That's great. And 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 it's so true. Like it's those those timeless things. If if you and I sat down and we got coffee, uh, just as fellow entrepreneurs, and you're telling me about your business, like you share that with some passion, with some enthusiasm, because um, mm-hmm. because we can relate. And you want to tell me about why your business is important and why it's special. But yet so many founders, so many leaders don't put that same attention into their new employee onboarding. Like you don't yeah. capture that story and, and explain why your company's different like you would to an investor or to a peer to all of your employees. And if you want oh. your employees rowing in the same direction, you want them aligned with the mission, you've got to pitch them in the same way you'd pitch an investor. So it's really important to capture those stories. I agree. I agree. I'd love to ask though, and this kind of touches on what you what you shared earlier, but we understand that when it comes to documenting where to start, just just start. It's really that simple. We we start with the role. We start with what's most important. Maybe don't focus. Maybe focus on you know what won't change. You know um, immediately. But how much documentation would you say in these early stages is too much? How much like detail is too much? There are schools of thought that believe that. In 2023, we don't need to tell someone every single step. They should just understand it. And we, we make these assumptions. And one thing that I often um, reflect on is the statement, am I the only person who knows this information? And would others benefit from this information? And we know that yeah. the answer is always yes. But again, like in your opinion, how much is too much? When do we kind of pull things back? Because I think owners and leaders are hesitant, hesitant, sorry, to get started because they're just overwhelmed with the amount. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you can't assume that people know what to do. Even if it's 2023, you can't assume. I saw this ad the other day. I hadn't seen it in years, but it is, it was this European, this old European ad, you know, it's old because it's in four by three. It's not even like a widescreen ad, but you've got this guy that's, he's kind of on a hill and he's running up the hill. He's jogging up the hill and he's tired. And so there's this car parked along the side of the hill, kind of on a cliff. And he stands next to the car and he starts to lean against it to stretch out his legs because he's tired. This other guy's driving up the hill and sees this man and he gets out of his car, goes over to help him and pushes the car off the cliff. And because he assumed that he's not stretching, he's trying to push this car off off the cliff, if you could imagine that. And so yeah. when when we assume like we could jump in and do something entirely wrong, you need to have the right instructions. You need to have the right clear expectations. And so how much is too much? That's going to depend on how big the company is. You know, like how much is too much for someone with five employees versus 500 employees is going to be very different. What I would say is that, uh, like I said earlier, you've got this like 60 to 80% of your business that doesn't change as frequently. And then you've got all of the space that you innovate. And so you want to change, you want to document the things that don't change as frequently. And you want to document the things that touch the most number of people. So just like you said, can someone else find this useful? I always think, is there some knowledge that is, you know, it, it needs to be known by the entire employee population, that's very high ROI. Let me write that stuff down. Is there other knowledge that needs to be known by this role, this job title that I've got 20 of? You know, like when I, in my video company, when we had 300 camera operators, it's very important to document the the consistent processes for camera operators to set up their camera and their tripod and how to name the files that were coming out of the camera, right? Because that stuff was being done so frequently in the business. It's less urgent to document processing payroll because there's one person that does that. Uh, And, you know, the counter argument to that would be, well, if you've got these mission critical things like processing payroll, uh, even though one person does them, you want a backup. You want someone to know how to do that if the if the one person is is sick or or you know not around. And so so you're always thinking through like, can I get high ROI from uh, documenting this because so many people need to do it consistently, or is there a big risk to my business if I don't have a backup? Is there is there you know is this kind of like an insurance policy? I'm writing this down so that there's continuity and the company can keep running. Yeah. You're making me think of, um, it was a video you did years ago now where you're, you're walking and you're in the office and you've got a stack of ball caps on your head, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And you're like, yeah. one by one, you're just taking them off. So one of them is like, 
copywriter, video editor, I don't know, finance person. And like the last hat, I think it might've been CEO. I don't know. But like, there's all these roles that we take on. And like the purpose of documentation is to enable you to live that life in that role in your zone of genius, if you will. Right. Because you have to understand that as the business grows as well, you are not the person that understands that thing, you know, as well as maybe you needed to understand in the beginning. There are people that have come along that are, are more well-versed and more well-educated in those topics and in those areas of focus. And so I think that's it too. It's understanding where your strengths are, where you bring the most value to the business, to the department, and then those things that are taking away the time or are not as valuable, right, for you to be doing, those are the things that you also need to then document and, and you know, get off your plate. So. I'll yeah, just... yeah. I, I love that ad, first of all. That was so fun to make. And then, uh, actually, I don't know if you saw this version of it, but when Damon John came on as a, an investor from, from uh, FUBU, he, we reshot that same ad with him doing it, with all the hats on his head, because okay. he started FUBU stitching hats and selling them out on the corner like he was hand making hats so he so it was kind of a funny right. meta little story about like you go from making hats to taking off the hats in the business but i think all of us identify with that and regardless of our company size once again when you start a business as a team of one you have all 100 roles or 200 roles in the business on your yeah. back you do everything and then as you grow you start to identify that this particular role is taking up a good chunk of my bandwidth. This particular task is taking up a lot of my time. And we only have so much time. We only have, even, even if you're a crazy founder working 18 hours a day, you only have so much time. And when you realize that you've got 20% or 40% of your time is kind of in this lane, you start to carve that role like making a statue out of stone you know you start to carve out that role and say this is a future position in my business and i can bucket all of these 10 or 20 responsibilities under that position and if i hire that person i can free up 40 percent of my own time and that's what we do to grow a business over and over and over again like cells dividing you know, like mm -hmm. you, you start doing everything and little by little you shed roles, you shed responsibilities, but the only way that you can adequately delegate and shed those responsibilities is with clear instructions. Because again, like we said early on, if you don't give people the instructions, you can't expect them to do the thing correctly. And if they do it yeah. wrong, you recoil and you pull it back. And that's why you can't grow. It's so true. And then it's like, you have now documented and you can delegate. And now as the founder, what can you do with all of that time, right? That you're now getting back. I know when I left my corporate job and started the agency years ago, which I'm no longer operating anymore, but my goal was to experience some sort of freedom, right? Everybody wants freedom. And we think when we start these businesses that that means you're going to be taking trips and, you know, doing whatever you want and having time at home with kids and family and, you know, buying, whatever, right? We all have different versions of it, but you realize really quickly that without the proper documentation, without the proper structure and the systems, you end up working this job that you created for yourself that you now hate and is silently, slowly killing you, right? You're, you're getting to this point of burnout. You're not enjoying things like you were before. And maybe this isn't you, Chris. I don't know. I'm talking about myself, but uh, <laughs> you know, like it, it's got like, over time, you know, and, and terrible benefits and, and you lose this sense of what it was to like, be free. Can, can you talk yeah. about your version of that? Because I know you have a spin on it where you like believe in work life harmony. Like, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? And what freedom looks like for you? Yeah, if, if you step back and realize that you're in a horrible situation, and your business is running your life, and it's not additive to your life, then you've got to realize that you are your own worst boss. Like you caused this problem, you know, yeah. and yeah. you, you really need to re-engineer the business and start with what is the, 
the, what are the constraints that I want to put on myself? How much am I going to work? What commitments do I have in, in my family or personal life that I need to work around? And so I've always believed in putting those personal things first in, you know, scheduling all of the, the, you know, trips with my kids and the date nights with my wife and, the you know, the dinners and ev everything that I want to do, put all that on the calendar first and then work fills in around it. Whereas if you let your work consume your life, then you find no time on your calendar for fitting in anything else. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's it, even at the very beginning of, of my consulting firm, I, I started taking a month off every summer and working, you know, very lightly, um, just kind of keeping, keeping up with things, but not really doing anything new. And I would go away somewhere else in the world. And, and this was with my wife at the time. As I had kids, we would take the kids away. And that's something that I've just maintained all through uh, growing my consulting business and growing Trainual because I set it up at the beginning. And so when we're inventing the life that we want, the business that we want, create the policies you want and the, the things that, you, that feel like you'd love to have someday, create the structure for that on day one at the beginning and then yeah. fill your work in around it and uh and you'll find you've got a much better business amazing i'd love to know because i i heard something just yesterday and i'm going to paraphrase because i can't actually recall what it is but it was basically um great entrepreneurs are, are built like with, with their with their teams right like we have people behind us um we have mentors we have influencers we have um advisors and, and whatnot and i'd love to know for you like who were those people or what were those lessons? Maybe let's go there. What were some of those lessons that you learned along the way that helped shape who you are? Because whether it's Damon John coming on as an investor, um, I know that Michael Gerber was involved in, to some extent at some point. And anyone who's read The E-Myth and, you know, is like me can say that the book changed their life. Um, you know, there, there are definitely people, you know, close to us and, you know, through some of these resources that we consume that help us get where we are. Could you share some of those lessons or some of those people on that have helped really shape who you are today? Yeah, it started with my parents and with an uncle that I had that had, ha, has his own business and just those kind of examples growing up. And, and that was more like the foundational core values, I think, that get shaped when you're younger. Then when I got into school, it was my professors, my business professors, entrepreneurship professors. I was the type of student that you know, when the teachers say they have open office hours, I would actually go to their office hours and just chat with them and get their feedback and, and get their extra help on my business. I saw all of my professors as like free consultants for my business. And I know it wasn't free. Obviously, there's a cost to school, but I don't think people leverage. They don't go above and beyond and leverage those resources that are available to them. Like even today, I make offer the the offer open door to any of our employees like anytime you want help with your goals with your career with what you're doing at work like book time with me and I will be a free consultant for you to just help you with that and you know every few months I get one person that takes advantage mm -hmm. of that of, of over 100 employees people just don't often uh, act on their opportunities and so that's something I always did growing up was whether it's my my professors or mentors that I'd meet in the business community, or I'd read a book by an author and I would email them and tell them everything I liked about the book and thank them for, for the content in the book. And when you do that over and over and over, over decades, you build a, a big network. One of my mentors told me that your network is your net worth. And I'm sure that's kind of like a cliche thing, but that always stuck with me that the more people that I get to know that I authentically help and make a part of my life and keep in touch with, the, the more opportunities I'm going to find that I wouldn't otherwise have. And it's not about, you know, um, like forcing things to happen. It's just about having a, a big enough network and, and that when the opportunities arise, I have visibility to them. You know, I'm like, I'm like in the room or I'm in the conversation. And, and I think you can create some of that. Someone else told me if they could go back 
to the beginning of their career, they would spend all their money to buy the nicest suit they could and go to the nicest party they could. And, you know, like that, that it's really all about how can you be in the room with the right people? And so that's, that's been a driving factor for me. When I was in, uh, you know, EO and these other mastermind groups early on, I made it a point to go to every member's office. To, I wanted to see their business. I want to go for a tour of their business. And wow. you think, how, how many people do you know in, in like a business group that have never even seen the inside of their friends' companies? You know, but if you go, if you make that extra effort, how much are you going to learn? How, how you know, much more will they like you for, for you know, ha- taking a peek into their world? And so that's been a big lesson for me is really lean in, get to know people, uh, especially when you're just getting started. Amazing. And, and how are some of these lessons shaping your future or the future of training? Well, I know you're working on some cool new projects. We're getting into a whole other world of AI and the workplace is changing and people are innovating. What are you taking away from this and how are you applying it to your future? What's next for you? Well, for me, I guess on the on the mentorship side, I've always had people that, that I look up to, that I watch, that I follow uh, because... I believe it's my job to become the CEO Tranual needs next year today. You know, like I always need to be outpacing the company's growth. If you can't personally grow faster than your company is growing, then you, it's not going to be a good fit. And that's not just for the owner or the CEO. That's for any role in the business. Your, if your company is growing then it's almost like you have to reapply for the same position you already have every year because a bigger company has a, a bigger requirements for the same position, you know? Yeah. So I'm always trying to push myself and learn from people a couple steps ahead of me. On the AI front, I mean, we're always innovating. One of the benefits of having my video company for 12 years is that it went from, you know, cameras where they're over the shoulder cameras with SVHS tapes and analog like editors to video CDs to DVDs to HD DVDs to Blu-ray to flash drives to video on demand to live streaming and the cameras were turning over every six months always had new tech and so it became kind of baked into me that we we always innovate if you're not changing things every few months then you know you're you're gonna fall behind and so I think I've taken that same approach to, to building Trainual and that we're always looking for new software tools. We're always carving out new roles. We're always making the product better. And you have to do that if you want to stay in business. Mm-hmm. I love that. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, you may have already said it and it's okay if you did, but are there any closing thoughts, anything that you haven't touched on where you need to communicate the message or the reason for documentation, why someone needs to start now. I'd love to close that way. Yeah, you mentioned freedom and you also mentioned the the LinkedIn post I put out earlier. What's on my mind right now is that everything that you're able to delegate, everything that you're able to document and to hand off to someone else puts a few minutes in the bank for you. Every time that you would have done that thing, you get to to bank those extra minutes saved. And it's the act of doing that over and over and over again that eventually gives you the the time bank account to really have freedom as an entrepreneur. I think that's what all of us are after. And so, you know, get started wherever you're at in your journey, start writing things down, start recording those videos, start telling people the stories, record it once, explain it once, uh, and, and you'll save yourself a lot of time. Um, and I've also got a, 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 a little gift for your listeners if Perfect. anyone's interested in Trainual, you can check out Trainual. We haven't talked much about the software, but use the code in systems, all caps, in systems 20, and you'll get 20% off your first year. Perfect. Thank you for that. That's great. Uh, I was going to ask exactly that where we can direct some folks. So, Chris, thank you so much. I love this chat. I'm glad we got to reconnect. Um, I know we could chat about systems and processes forever. Uh, maybe we'll have you back to talk just about Trainual in the future, but thanks for your time. Thanks, Marky.